All right, quick recap. Where have we been in this class so far? Been here about 16 weeks. What, what did we do first? Do you remember? Okay, yeah, we started. Why the Reformation was important? Celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And we went through the solas. Remember the solas? Mark Sally, you remember the solas? Gratier, uh huh. Uh, Two more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyone to help him? We know solo de glory is at the end. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, solo fide. Solo, solo gratia. We're missing one. Uh, Christus. Christus, right, yeah. And then we said, that was good stuff. Let's spend a little more time. So what did we do for about another six weeks? Reformers. Reformers. We looked at biographies. Okay, who was your favorite? Swingley. You like Swingley? Yeah. Of course, because you taught on it, right? <laughs> uh, you did Luther. Okay, Rudy, what did he do? Who did he do? Calvin. Calvin. Yeah, we gave him the, the big one. Knox. Learned a lot about Knox. That was exciting. It was like something out of Braveheart. Okay. And then we thought, well, that's not enough either. We can't do all this if we don't do what? Doctrines of Grace. Okay. And so we spent a week did the history. So that these, uh, these five points of Calvinism did not uh, arise or, or start with Calvin, but in fact were a response to the five points of what? Remember? Arminianism, yeah. The followers of Jacob Arminius, 100 years after nailing the 95 Thesis to the door in Wittenberg. We have the followers of Jacob Arminius, who spent some time in Geneva, uh, said that the Reformation didn't go far enough, but what we kind of saw, we've been talking a whole lot about this term, semi-what? Pelagianism. He said the Reformation did go far enough, but in fact, what did, he, what did he really advocate? Kind of circling back to where Rome had been the last 800 years. And so we talked about these five points. They were called the Remonstrants. And um, what did the Dutch Reformed Church do? They received these, and, and rather than immediately discount them, do you remember what they did? They said, we need to study them. We can't just dismiss these out of hand. We need to study them. So they spent eight months, and they brought in doctors and lawyers and theologians and pastors and scholars. For eight months, they studied this, and they responded with what came to be known as the five points of Calvinism. And, of course, we know it by the acronym TULIP, right? And we said Calvinist's favorite flower is the tulip. What's the Arminiast, Arminian's favorite flower? The daisy. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Okay? So, so far we've heard total depravity. Okay? Aaron gave us total depravity. I mean, his wife's attested to that, that Aaron embodies total depravity. Aaron, what did you say about total depravity that was interesting? All the points rise or fall with this one point. Did you do total depravity? No. Who? Sorry, Chris. You did unconditional election. But we said basically everything hangs on total depravity or, or what we would call total inability. Now, does total depravity mean you're as, you're as bad as you could be? No. What does it mean, though? Everybody's bad. Everybody's bad. Everyone, everyone's nature is thoroughly corrupted by the fall. In fact, we even used the illustration. We took the greatest phil philanthropist in the world. Someone mentioned Bill Gates and said, as far as we know, Bill's not a believer and he is totally depraved. And you said, but he's doing all these wonderful things. Why? According to scripture. For self. For self. Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, that's, that's where all of these points rise and fall. So if you're like me, you grew up in a Bible church or perhaps a Southern Baptist church, if you talked about it, we have a tendency to say we are four-point Calvinists. You ever heard of that? Or, you know, if you went to Southwestern, maybe you're like a, a, a three or a three-and-a-half-point Calvinist, okay? It was a real common thing in the last 25 years. And uh, I listened to late R.C. Sproul recently, and he said, I, I need to explain to you why that's not really possible. But before you get offended, uh, what he explained is, he says, they all fit together. And they all fit together in that salvation is a monergistic act of God, that God saves. We, a year ago, we went through the order of salutis, right? The order of salvation. And y'all did great, you know? He 
foreknew, predestined, elected, uh, Christ died, Holy Spirit effectually calls, regenerates, gives the gift of faith and repentance, sanctifies, and eventually glorifies, right? It was a wonderful uh, masterpiece of God's salvation. So today we come to, I think, what is always considered the toughest of the tulip. It's the L, right? And uh, we kind of avoid this, right? I remember being part of a very solid church growing up, and it's like, ooh, we don't talk about this one. And if we do, we, 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 we paint this caricature. Most churches either don't discuss it or expect people, if you come from a PCA background, Presbyterian background, you better get it right off the bat or something's wrong with you, right? I, I loved it. Um, it really grew under the ministry of, of Denton Bible Church, and um, Tom was, uh, was unashamedly, Calvinist. I didn't really understood what, understand what that meant. But one thing I appreciated is that he went to Scripture on everything. He was a Biblicist, and he compelled us with the Scriptures. And he allowed me, unwittingly, the elders allowed me to grit my teeth for months on end while being compelled by the Scriptures. And that's all I want to ask us today, is to be compelled by the Scriptures. Uh, a couple of uh, great resources if you want to study this. Uh, we've talked about this one here, Five Points of Calvinism, by Steele, Steele and uh, Thomas, uh, Lance Quinn, who was uh, out of uh, Arkansas, did a lot with this right here. Regarding limited atonement, this is the big one here, Death of Death and the Death of Christ, 1691, John Owen. Uh, it, it, it is a laborious read. It's really good, but if you like the cliff notes, <laughs> Life by His Death, okay? G.I. Packer basically takes this and puts it here. So you might want to read this one first. This is a very easy read and a lot of fun. Uh, Packer really knows how to update things. So let's talk about limited atonement, okay? When I studied this years ago, I wanted to bring our elders and deacons along because I wanted us to be more about shepherding people than I did about ticking off the box of theology. And so I wrote something and I said, how do you shepherd someone coming into your church with the concept of limited atonement? Because right off the bat, that phrase is uncomfortable, right? What do you mean the atonement is limited? So we're going we're gonna to use a different term here this morning. I have no problem using that term, but, uh, but, but it helps to understand what is meant by limited atonement. So I want to start with how do you shepherd someone with regards to this concept? Because you have two kinds of people who are familiar with this that come to your church. You have the person that comes in and says, do you believe in limited atonement? Like, if you do, I'm out of here before Ryan quits playing music, okay? Or you have the guy that comes in and says, do you believe in limited atonement? You know, with their clipboard. Like, if you don't, I'm out of here. Now, the problem with this is that there's so many different definitions of limited atonement that if we're more about shepherding hearts and people than we are about ticking boxes in theology, I think it behooves us to respond with, well, what do you mean by limited atonement? And so what, the way I want to approach this today is I want to help us shepherd hearts with the scriptural understanding of what happened at the cross. Specifically, what was two things, the intent and what was accomplished. All right? And if we can do this, then we find ourselves taking the gospel and 1 Thess 2 8, imparting the word and imparting our lives to others. So let's talk about the first one who says, Do you believe in limited atonement? Because if you do, I'm out of here. Okay? So the first thing I would respond with is, I, I don't really know. What, what do you mean by limited atonement? Let's talk about some caricature responses, responses that I've used in the past. Okay? How about this one? Speaking of Jim Chukas. Well, that's not my Jesus who wouldn't die for everyone. That is, I don't know where you're getting that, but that is so unloving. Right? Okay? So that's the first. Let me start off by saying that the word limited... The reason it's not always helpful, again, I'm not afraid to use it at all, but the reason it's not always helpful is that the value of the atonement is not limited. 
Meaning that if, if, if someone was to respond that way to me and say, that's not my Jesus who wouldn't die for everyone, I would say, well, explain to me what you mean. And they would say, well, I, I think it's wrong to think that people who want to come to Christ can't because he didn't die for them. And I would say, well, I don't believe that either. And the Bible doesn't teach that either. Okay? The atonement, what do I mean by atonement, by the way? Make sure we're on the same page. What does atonement mean? Payment, yeah. Literally, it means covering, but it's a payment for sin, okay? The Old Testament, we see the Jews celebrating the Day of Atonement, okay? When we talk about the atonement, we're talking about what happened at the cross, payment for sin. And so people will say, well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's fair that, that, that Christ wouldn't die for someone who would believe. And you say, well, I don't believe that either. The atonement is not limited in its value or its scope, okay? It's sufficient for all. If all 7 billion people in the world right now believe in Jesus Christ, is there enough blood to go around, metaphorically, right? We would say, amen. Do we believe in the whosoever will passages? Absolutely. In no way uh, is the gospel limited or the, or the blood of Christ or his atonement not sufficient for all. But it is efficient for only those who believe. Well, that person would say, well, well, I believe that. I mean, Judas is paying for his sins in hell, right? The blood of Christ has not been applied to Judas's life. And they would say, well, I believe in that. And they'd say, okay, well, so there's, there's no problem there. Let's look at another caricature. Uh, before I go on, let me, let me uh, uh, Piper says something really interesting. He says, when someone responds that way and you're able to clarify it, a great thing to say is, I believe exactly what you're saying, but Calvinists believe more than that. They believe that the atonement is sufficient for all and efficient for some. We don't believe less than that. It's not limited in that way. We believe more than that. We believe the Bible teaches that more happened on the cross. Okay? We're going to talk about that. I want you to write down uh, this phrase, purchased a bride. We're going to come back to that over and over again. Calvinists don't believe less, of course, whosoever will. But Cal Calvinists believe that Christ secured something on the cross, that he purchased a bride, and so much more. Here's another caricature response. God doesn't choose some for heaven and push others into hell. And I would say, well, I agree. The Bible doesn't teach that either meaning that they will use what's called a, a warped view, the technical term is a warped view of double predestination, okay? Not the correct view, but a warped view, where God regenerates some, takes out the heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh, causes the scales to fall from their eyes, gives them faith and repentance, imputes righteousness to those who believe, and then he puts evil in others and pushes them into hell. And we say, well, I don't believe that. And the Bible doesn't teach that. But that God's choice, the Father's choice of those whom he would save, is that he everyone's running off the cliff into hell, and he chooses to regenerate some, and he passes over others. It's still a choice, but one is an active choice, one is a passive choice. You've heard me use this illustration of, uh, you know, if I went into Baskin Robbins, I, I chose cookies and cream because that is the best ice cream, Right? It would be unusual for someone to come up and say, why did you choose not strawberry? Well, yeah, I guess in a sense it was a choice, but it was, I, I left strawberries to its own devices because it's a fruit. It's not ice cream, you know? So it, there's, there's the passing over. It is a choice, but it is a different type of choice. But here's what's interesting. That's as far as I used to go with this. Almost like I'm, I'm trying to defend a logical argument. And limited atonement is always written off as being, oh, that's, yeah, that's the one logical point. Like, we don't really even need that one. That's for, that's for hyper-doctrinal people who really want to get into the nitnoids of things. And that's what I used to think. And so I would, I would kind of come out with this, this, uh, these defenses. Of course I don't believe that. Of course I don't believe that. And, and of course I don't believe that. Now we're good, right? But I love what Sproul says. He goes, so far all you've done 
is agreed with everyone else in evangelicalism and stood against the Unitarians, the Universalists, right? Everyone, if they're Orthodox Christian, believes that the, the sacrifice on the cross is, is sufficient for all and efficient for some. Everyone should rightly believe that, that God graciously uh, chooses some and, and, and passes over those and leaves them to their own devices in nature. What limited atonement is is so far beyond that. And this is where we're going to get some group, group exercises going here. What was the intent of the cross and what did it accomplish? Those two things. What was the intent and what was, uh, what was accomplished? Here's where I want to take us. I want to start by giving us the Arminian point in 1618. That this is what they came forward with. Second, we're going to spend about 10 minutes and we're going to look at verses and we're going to answer this question. Before I tell you what limited atonement is, we're going to answer this question by just looking at scripture. Thirdly, I'm going to give you the response of the Dutch Reformed Church that says, this is the summation of what we just studied. And then fourthly, we're going to look at some problem passages on how to answer these. Here's what I think you're going to be encouraged by this morning. This is not a logical argument. This is a devotional explanation of the gospel that is so often overlooked. We're all willing to embrace, you know, election and predestination and foreknowledge and, and, and God setting his affection upon us. We're all willing to talk about how God carries us through the tough times and how he uses trials to shape our faith and how one day we shall be like him. But we have a tendency to reduce the cross to, yeah, Jesus paid for my sins. And we're missing out. It's so much more. Okay? We good with that? Let's start off here. Let me give you the Arminian definition. This is what they brought 100 years after the 95 Thesis were nailed to the door in Wittenberg. They came and said, you didn't go far enough. You misunderstood the cross. Quote, Christ's redeeming work. I'm going to do with the got any military guys here. Okay, what, what, yeah, what happens when you do this when you're teaching in the military? Uh, write it down. <laughs> I'm going to teach you all this stuff. This is what's going to be on the test, okay? <laughs> I'm going to do this a couple of times on some important points that you're going to want to keep in mind because when you look at these verses, what you want to see is, does Scripture line up with the definition? Okay? Christ's redeeming work made it possible for everyone to be saved, but did not actually secure the salvation of anyone. Although Christ died for all men, only those who believe in him are saved. His death enabled God to pardon sinners on the condition they believe, but did not actually put away anyone's sins. Christ's redemption becomes effective only if man chooses to accept it. I'm going to read that again, but just I want you to pick up about those five things there. They're all they're all saying, uh, they're all different views of the same thing. Christ's redeeming work made it possible for everyone to be saved, but did not actually secure the salvation of anyone. Although Christ died for all men and for every man, only those who believe in him are saved. His death enabled God to pardon sinners on the condition they believe, but it did not actually put away anyone's sins. Christ's redemption becomes effective only if man chooses to accept it. Now, here's what's interesting. A lot of us would kick back and say, I don't believe in limited atonement, not realizing what you actually embrace if you don't believe in limited atonement. So even if you're here this morning, you're like, yeah, I never know about that one. That one I don't feel really good about. I want you to understand what you believe, what position you take if you don't. Okay? That definition I just read made it possible. The cross didn't actually atone for sins, but it made it possible in the future when you believe for God to wipe away your sins. Uh, it only becomes effective at that time. It enabled God the Father. Okay? So we're going to talk about that. So here's the fun exercise. Um, good. Everyone's at tables. Got some verses here. I expect you to actually open your Bibles. And, but grab one. Look at it. If it's a big one, grab one more. If it's a small one, grab two more, okay? So grab two or three verses each. Spend the next eight to ten minutes and just 
answer the question, what was the intent of the atonement and what did it accomplish? And I want to push us here. I don't want our answers to just be, you know, uh, Christ died for da da da, or he secured salvation, or he paid for our sins. Look at these verses. There's a lot there. There's a lot there about what God intended, his affections, his knowledge, his gathering in of sheep. You know, really, really stretch yourself on these things. Joy, would you pass these out? And we're going to go until quarter till, so about eight minutes. We're going to do in eight minutes what the Synod of Dort did in eight months when we started. Instead of using limited atonement, definite atonement, or an old Puritan term is particular redemption. And it's, it's, it's answering for whom did Christ die. So what I want to do is I'm just going to throw out the reference, read it. Whoever, whoever's table uh, has that, just give me some, some input you know, on what you've learned, what you've, what you've noticed. Because a lot of these are so familiar to us that we have a tendency to just sort of jump over it. Like, Jesus died for my sins. Jesus died for my sins. Okay? John 10, 15. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Who has that? What you got? What did you notice out of that? Um, he, he died to bring his sheep into his fold from outside the fold. Yeah. Great metaphor there. Yeah. Okay. Anyone think of a, a good hymn that uh, says that well? A good line from a hymn? Can, can, can we say, when, when, uh, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind? It's kind of hard to sing that if you don't believe this, right? Because, let me bring up one thing here. If Christ died only to make it possible, what are you presuming about faith? Is faith God's gift to man or man's gift to God? Man's gift to God. You can't say faith is God's gift to man, but Christ came to make it possible. Unless you want to say every other saving work of God is sovereign and good except for the cross. It's a hard argument to make. Okay? All right, John 11, 51 and 52. Now, he did not, this is Caiaphas talking. Uh, he, Caiaphas has said, hey, it's expedient for one guy to die in order for us to, to save this, this structure we have. And then commentary is, now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might gather together into one the children of God who scattered abroad. Who has that? That was our table over here. All right. I, mean, I struggled with that, with the it's context a tough one. of it, because this is Caiaphas and the Pharisees. <coughs> and they said, and we're going to kill him. Right. Because, right. because he was going to bring in uh, the non-Jews. The non the non and you just nailed it right there. Because what did the Jews expect from their Messiah? Salvation was to come from him to... Right, right. And so what does this tell you? This is... This is For everyone. Right. Okay. John 17, 11. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. So this is the intent. I mean, this is our mm -hmm. true intent and accomplishment from this verse. Right. Okay. Uh, so in the high priestly prayer, the intent was uh, to secure our salvation. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to come over here. For what was the purpose? Secure. Okay, I'm going to press you a little bit. Salvation. Give me, go deeper on that. Secure what? His people's salvation. Okay. Say, so there's, there's a lot involved there. There's, there's forgiveness. What else is there in regards to salvation? Adoption. Adoption. <laughs> See, this is important to remember that what particular redemption, what definite atonement says is that it was at the cross where sins were forgiven. Okay, it was at the cross where salvation was affected. It wasn't that it was a possibility and then later on this happened. And you can't just have, watch this, you can't just have the propitiation for sin, wrath, satisfaction, and not have imputation of Christ's righteousness. So they're saying that the cross is the center point of history where it was accomplished. We would use a metaphor like this. It's where the dowry was paid. It's where the slave was redeemed. It was where... 
it is what? Finished. Exactly. You have a hard time saying it is finished. You have to say it is possible. Okay? All right. Uh, Hebrews 2, 13 through 15. I got five minutes more and then I got to get into something. Um, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. And I gave it to the wrong guy because he's going to preach now. <laughs> Yeah. But then we have, behold, I and the children, the children, who are the children, verse 11, those being made holy. Okay. Um, I, I see in this, uh, he's, he's taking on uh, flesh and blood. Uh, we can explain later is uh, his love, he's a merciful and faithful high priest. Uh huh. This goes back to what we were talking about. So he said several things, you know, made holy, merciful high priest. It is the cross that accomplished this. So I go back to, this is not an us and them with Arminian theology. This is more yes and more. Because Arminians, I don't really think, believe that those who are in hell have had their sins paid for. I don't think if you press them on that subject, is that a fair? I mean, I've watched enough Law and Order, right? And what I used to when it was clean, I guess, to know that that's called what? Double, double jeopardy. If if the price has been paid, then what do, what do you what are you paying for in hell? No, no, I don't think anyone really thinks that. I think what they're battling is a caricature. So I think the best way to do this, again, to shepherd hearts, is to say, yes, those whosoever passages are real, real. But no, he didn't come to make it possible. We believe more than that. He came to purchase a bride, secure salvation, adopt us, make us holy, be our faithful high priest. Everything flows from the cross. Another great work to read, it's John Stott's the cross, the cross of Christ. About a 300-page book. It is outstanding. I mean, uh, Sproul said it this way. He said, after 50 years of studying the cross, I feel like I'm just starting to scratch the surface. And if we say that this is the center point of what we believe, why do we have it be so anemic? If you grew up in a Southern Baptist arena, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Completely ripped out of context. Play just as I am 15 times to get people to come forward. You're, you're really, really missing the point. John Owen says, Jesus is not some weak guy who's just begging for us to come to him. He conquered death at the cross. He set captives free. He adopted and purchased a bride. I mean, it's this, it's this masculine picture of God securing salvation for people who do not deserve it. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, God is so masculine that all of creation is feminine by comparison. Isn't that great? All right, I got time for about two more. Someone just read a verse and tell me uh, what you learned from it. Preach it, brother. Give it to me. He, he rendered powerless the one who had the, the power of death. Yeah. So, I mean, that brings up the fact that he's just, and that the penalties all taken care of, the deal is squared, law is, is atoned for. He also gives us the power of us. Right. The power of the power. Well, and, and look at this. If Christ died to make it possible, go back to what I said a minute ago then who breaks the tie vote between God and Satan? We do. If Christ didn't die for his sheep, then Christ died for no one because the, there's the possibility that no one would come to him. And in fact, if we have to give faith to God, no one would come to him. So therefore, Christ dies on the cross for no one. That's not a logical. That means if you're going to not believe in a total depravity, an unconditional election, that faith is God's gift to man, it necessitates that you can't believe in this. 
But if you don't believe in this, then you got to go back and say, well, who's given the faith? Because what you're doing is you're kicking the can down the road. It wasn't accomplished here, but it's accomplished here. So who becomes the author and perfecter of our faith? We do. That was kind of confusing, but <laughs> let, me, let me read for you a couple things. Then we're going to go to a couple of um, uh, objections here. Um, to bear the sins of many, Hebrews 9.28 Matthew 1.21, for he will save his people from their sins. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. The intent, not just seek and save, but it goes further, to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, while we were yet sinners, Romans 5.8, Christ died for us. I know my own, John 10, know my own and my own know me. Came to save and to sanctify. John 6, all who gives me will... He, uh, all who the Father gives me will come to me, and I lose nothing. Um, John 17, high priestly prayer. We talked about that. Acts 20, 28. We always focus on be on guard for wolves coming from among the flock. What we forget is that which he has purchased with his own blood. So come back to that statement. Christ came to purchase a bride. We're talking about shepherding hearts again, not about winning an argument. Use that. I remember I went to, I went to my very favorite a seminary professor who was, you would, you would call him sort of a four-point Calvinist. And I said, but if I'm looking at the doctrines of grace and I believe that Christ didn't die for his sheep, but he died to make it possible, then how can I say that Christ came to purchase a bride? And he was, he was, he was slightly offended by that. He goes, oh, you can still say that. He didn't want to let it go because he believed that. He didn't, but, but he was fighting a straw man argument. So hold on to that. Christ came to purchase a bride. And of course, we know that so well from Ephesians 5. He loved the church and he gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. That it all goes together, doesn't it? All right. Uh, and then, of course, it comes together. Hebrews 9, 28, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. And then Revelation 5, 9, worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. So let me read to you the Synod of Dort response. In comparison to the previous definition, Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and actually secured salvation for them. His death was the substitutionary endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain sinners. In addition to putting away the sins of the people, Christ's redemption secured everything necessary for their salvation, including faith, which unites us to them. The gift of faith is infallibly applied by the Spirit to all for whom Christ died and thereby guaranteeing their salvation. He didn't come to make salvation possible. He came to purchase a bride. So, Let's talk about a couple of scriptural objections, because this is what comes to mind. One, okay, if you're still watching football, the guy in the end zone, John 3, 16, okay? What's the kick back there? If this is true, then whosoever cannot be true. That's, that's basically the argument. If this is true, then how can I say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, right? Okay? That's what I hear pushback on. Um, first of all, I think it's important not to just run to gymnastics with the text, not to run to hermeneutical gymnastics. God so loved the, what's the Greek word? Cosmos, okay. At the very, very base, okay, do we believe in a general call, that it is sincere? That when God says, all who will come to me, I will receive, not cast out. Absolutely. You know, whoever believes, whosoever, absolutely. I think this text goes deeper than that, but at the very least, before I understood anything about definite atonement, I don't have a problem with this. Um, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I don't have a problem with that. God desired that David wouldn't sleep with Bathsheba and commit adultery, but yet it was part of his decree also that from that union would come Solomon and his temple. Okay? God can desire us to be obedient to him, and yet he can use either evil or circumstances or everything else in his decree. So I don't have a problem with the general call being genuine. It's more than that. He offers salvation to all, but no one will take it, so he effects it. But I think it's more than that, okay? Uh, 
the word world there. If you look at the very next verse, okay, John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The world might be saved through him. No one believes that the world is all saved through him. You can't be a savior of the unsaved, right? Did you catch that? You can't be a savior of the world, a savior of the unsaved, if world means every person. So I think a normative reading of the text is, world doesn't mean every individual. Certainly not here. Uh, John uses the same phrase again in 442. He refers to Jesus as savior of the world, but he's clearly not talking about every individual. So I think it's best to understand this, that though it could mean God loves his creation and there is a general call, I think it's even deeper than that to point out that Jesus is the savior of not just the Jews, but of all nations. That's Revelation 5, 9, of, of every tribe and tongue. For God so loved not just the Jews, but the world. But here's a more difficult one. This is the one people always go to. John, 1 John chapter 2. And he himself, chapter 2, verse 2, and he himself is the propitiation, the wrath satisfier for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Those of the whole world, is, it's, it's in italics, that's an interpret, that's a transliteration. For he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. And you're like, oh, well, now I, I can't believe definite atonement because of this, this text here. Well, there's two issues there. One... If propitiation is the wrath satisfaction of the paycheck that we've earned, all right, wages of sin is death, okay, we've all earned this paycheck of death, and he paid that on the cross, are we ready to say, as I said earlier, that people in hell are paying their wages of sin? Did Jesus die for Stalin? To just use a, a polemical example. Did Jesus die for Hitler. Did he? Did Jesus die for Jews? Did Jesus on the cross say, I am paying the death, eternal death wage that Hitler and Judas earned? Okay, so there's a theological rub there. We interpret the unclear by the clear. I've just given you just a smattering of, of dozens and dozens of verses that say otherwise. But linguistically, again, and this is the bigger response, whole world doesn't mean every person. Romans 1.8, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Does that mean every, by the time Paul wrote Romans, every person in the whole world had heard the gospel? Of course not. The Chinese hadn't heard it. People in England hadn't heard it, or what well, would be England. Revelation 3.10, John's writing, same author. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Okay, in that verse, I'm going to keep you from this hour of testing. So there's a group of people that are going to be kept from the hour of testing, but that testing is coming upon the whole world. So it doesn't mean each individual person. I think the best understanding, though, of what John is saying when he says whole world there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, is what he uses previously in the gospel. Parallel passage. Turn to John chapter 11. What was the Revelation? Revelation 3.10. Turn to John chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 51, and I'll close it out with this. John 11:51. Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. The Jews would celebrate once a year the Day of Atonement. Their understanding from the Pentateuch, from the law, from the prophecies towards the Messiah is that this day was one for the forgiveness, it was a picture for the forgiveness of the nation. Okay, And John says, Jesus, the Messiah, the Amashiach, the anointed one of Israel, didn't come to die just for the nation, 
but for the whole world that he might gather in the children of God who are scattered abroad. People from every tribe, tongue, and nation. John, Galatians 2.9 says he was an apostle to the Jews. And it seems best to understand that John is pointing out that Christ satisfied the wrath not just for Jewish believers, but for those of every nation. If we were to bring it all down and say, well, what is definite atonement? It means that from eternity past, our triune God chose to reconcile the very creation that was created to worship, created for worship, to reconcile that creation to himself. And each particular member of the Trinity took part in this reconciliation and redemption. God the Father foreknew, chose, predestined. The Holy Spirit would be the one that would effectually call, regenerate, grant faith and repentance. Uh, Philippians 2, 11 and 12, and would work to sanctify us and grow us and work out our salvation. That Christ would return and one day we would be glorified. But in the very center of it all, the Prince of Heaven said, I will go. And he threw off his royal robes and he went to make it all possible. No, he went to purchase that bride. And in purchasing that bride, he didn't just, like when we get married, just wipe away your school debt, okay? He purchased her. He took her home. He adopted her. He sanctified her. And guess what? He's coming back for her. So when people say, and I don't believe that limited atonement because of this, I oftentimes just simply say, yeah, I don't agree with that either. I understand what you're saying, but it's so much more. Can we talk about what happened at the cross and what was our triune God's intention? And then you just go to Scripture. It's, as Aaron said, it's far more devotional than it is and it even is theological. Let me pray for us and we'll go worship together. Father, we thank you for this time. I just scratched the surface with this, uh, this doctrine. I pray that uh, it would compel us to study it more. And as we study the cross, that it would result not in us becoming fat theologically, but in us becoming faithful devotionally. And may we worship in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.